Has anyone here heard of a charity called Samaritans? Just raise your hand if you've heard of the charity. Cool. Um, is anyone here a volunteer at Samaritans? OK, cool. Um, so in my mid-20s, uh, my girlfriend had broken up with me. And uh, the small family that I had, uh, I was living with her, my mum, her sister, we all had to disperse in different parts. And I ended up living alone. I'm an only child of a single mother, so living alone was a pretty big deal for me. And it was a, it was a very new experience. I'm a very goal-oriented person. And I've always set ambitious goals for myself. And I was saying to Henry earlier, I like the feeling of being an amateur. So I'd set myself the goal of being with this person for the rest of my life. And when they broke up with me, I felt like I failed. So I was thinking to myself, if, if I'm failing at this goal for something that's super important to me, how do I know I'm going to succeed in other things? How do I know I've got what it takes to work at Monzo? <laughs> um, and at my lowest, I didn't feel suicidal. So some of you, if, you, if you're familiar with the Charity Samaritans, they uh, started out as a suicide helpline. And they started out as a charity. Uh, the reason why they started actually is quite interesting is because a young lady had taken her life, uh, mistaking her period for something else. Um, so I, I decided to call Samaritans. I, I didn't know what to expect. And I thought, well, I'm not feeling suicidal. But the way I'm feeling, this could get bad. And I don't want it to get bad. So I dialed a number, uh, 116, one, two, three. And the person picked up and said, hello, Samaritans, how are you feeling? For the first two minutes, it was just silence. It was the first time I ever experienced a conversation like that, where they ask you a question and they create space. Nothing else is said throughout the call. Um, and I felt uncomfortable. I didn't know where to start. And like anyone else uh, carrying out a conversation, I'll start with, uh, how, how are you doing? <laughs> uh, they didn't respond. They just kept quiet. Um, and after a while, they repeated, how are you feeling today? And I started to talk about how I was feeling. It was very uncomfortable. Um, it's, it's deeply uncomfortable to really have to express to someone how you're feeling when they won't respond. They won't give anything to you. You really have to dig. So I told them the story. I told them about my character, how goal-oriented I am. Um, and after listening, creating space, playing back things to me, uh, which was the first time I've experienced it being done in that way, uh, the Samaritan asked me a question that changed how I think about goal setting. And it's a really helpful question. And it's one that I keep coming back to. The question was, uh, do you think you're being fair on yourself by setting goals and objectives that are dependent on the choices and actions of other people? Um, and it completely shifted my mindset. I, I felt I wasn't being realistic to myself. How could I set myself a goal of being with someone else when they could just change their minds? I could end up being not the right person for them. So that really helped me um, with thinking about how you work through situations where a human being is going through crisis and how you create safe space. I don't think Click is working. I might have to be close to it. How you create a safe space for people to express their humanity. One of the things that I realized um, through that call was that there are people out there that have a certain skill set that can help really uncover where someone might be in their lives. And I thought to myself, being very curious and being very goal-oriented, I need to learn whatever that person did on the phone. I'm going to find out how to do that. So I looked online. I looked at the website. And I ended up volunteering. Um, I've been a volunteer Samaritan now for five years. And very recently, I've become a director for my local branch of Samaritans of 100 people. One of the things that Samaritans has taught me is that ultimately, no matter how long a conversation you have with someone, and it could be a parent, it could be your siblings, it could be someone that you've known from the moment they were born, you only ever have a window into someone's life. You're not there all the time. And as practitioners of exper experience creation, we, we pride ourselves in how much we're listening, how much we give space for customers, and uh, how many user interviews we carry. But ultimately, what you have is just a window into someone's life. You don't see the full room. You don't see the full house. And that mental model of where you are has really helped me uh, in how I think as a designer, as a creative. What that means is that you have to accept that there's always room for you misunderstanding something or for you not having the full picture, the full information. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about, about Monzo. Uh, Monzo's mission started with essentially creating the world's financial control center. And I don't personally think that's a, a very sexy mission these days. Um, and we're kind of rethinking it. Uh, that quote is a quote from Monzo's pitch deck by, uh, put together by Tom Blumfield, who's no longer in the company. Interestingly enough, uh, part of the reason I was attracted to, to Monzo is because when Tom Blumfield left Monzo, he was very open about his mental health struggles. And you can watch interviews on Spotify. There's, there, there are quite a few podcasts where he speaks about this very openly. I've mentioned to you, but also my own character. So being the child of a single mother, coming from a working class background, um, finance has always been something that my family struggled with. And it's always been something that I always dreamed that there'll be a world in which there'll be tools that would help people like my mom to make the most of the money they have. Um, and there's only so far that these tools can make, but this vision was what really attracted me to come work at Monzo. So this is the Monzo app, app in its early days. It doesn't look like this anymore. But some of the things that stood out about it in its uh, early days, and part of the reason uh, we grew as quickly as we did, people really appreciated the fact that unlike every other banks at the time, when you spend on your Monzo, you can see it. There will be a notification that says you spend five pound at Greg's, um, as many of us do. And, <laughs> and you'll be able to see uh, that you can create various different pots. And pots, uh, not a lot of people actually understand this about pots. Pots aren't savings accounts. Lots of people still think they are. But they're very compartmentalized places that you can just put your money, uh, quite literally, like a pot of money in your Monzo app. So it means that you can use it for bills. So you can put away a pot for all of your monthly bills. And at the beginning of each month, you can sort your money into your pots. You can categorize your spending. So we get data from MasterCard. So each time you spend your card, MasterCard has data to help us understand what category does that merchant fit into. So if you spend your groceries, MasterCard knows that that's, that merchant is a grocer. So in the Monzo app, we show that to you. We let you know that. Other banks could do that too, but they don't. Um, I'm not bragging, by the way. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just saying that that's what happens. Um, <clears throat> and we also have P2P payments, which is an acronym for peer-to-peer -peer payments. So it means that if you're on Monzo and the person you're trying to pay is on Monzo and you've got their number, <clears throat> why should you have to put in the account details and store code? So we built a network that means that as long as both of you are on Monzo and both of you have switched on the ability to pay each other in the app for privacy reasons, you can pay each other without any account numbers or sort codes. And this, these are big reasons uh, as to why people sort of um, decide to, to use Monzo and why we've continued to grow very quickly, even today. Um, I think we grow roughly uh, over 100,000 customers each month. So, we're kind of thinking of our mission these days as more along these lines, uh, being at the heart of our customers' financial lives. And what that means is if you think about the earlier mission, the first uh, mission that we stated, the being a financial control center, what image comes to your mind? You think probably a big dashboard, lots of buttons and lots of graphs and very complex images. Um, actually, what we're learning is that might not be the most useful thing for a lot of people. There are people with very and cognitive uh, ability, very, very different cognitive spectrums. More information does not necessarily mean better decisions, but visibility can, and helping people view where they are, give them a, a complete picture of their financial lives can make a difference. So this is an example of um, some, one of the ways in which we use that data that we already have to start to cleverly inform people how they're spending. So if we know that you, you've spent X amount on specific categories, then we can aggregate that for you. And we can show you, hey, by the way, did you know roughly most of your money is going on eating out? Uh, this, this, isn't, this isn't mine, by the way. I, I spend even more than that on eating out. Um, and now, if you've subscribed to one of our paid products, we have Monzo Plus, which is five pound a month. Um, and it brings a range of features with it. And Monzo Premium brings a, an additional range of features with it you can have a very in-depth view of your spending. And it doesn't, it doesn't start from the point you buy the subscription. We'll be able to look back of all time, all the data that we have, and we'll be able to show you how your spending has been happening month on month, week on week. You can break it down in different ways. You can view it by merchant. You can view it by categories. We're starting to give people the choice of how they want to break down 
their financial lives and how they want to view and make decisions. And equally, if we know something useful, for example, we can know when a direct debit is coming up because we have, we have that data. We know when it usually comes up. And we know what your balance is. We can let you know that you don't have enough money for that. And we can avoid that direct debit not going through, perhaps even multiple times because you've forgotten and then suddenly you found yourself being chased up by the energy provider. And certainly during an energy crisis, this is a useful thing to have. But another thing that a lot of people, uh, the use Monzo, aren't aware of is when you have uh, your salary paid into Monzo, and how we define salary is mixed. So we know that people's pay cycles vary. So most people that get paid monthly think a salary is a monthly thing, but actually people get paid weekly sometimes. People get paid by job. Uh, in a gig economy, you have people driving Ubers, et cetera. A salary means very different things to people. But whenever it hits your account, if, if we know roughly how much you need to cover, for example, for your certain bills. Uh, you can go into a payment amount that you've received into your account, as long as like 100 pound plus. Uh, we set that just because it seemed like the right number. Um, you can go into that amount and you can say, hey, each month, I want, uh, whenever I receive this specific amount, I want 200 to go into my bills, I want 150 to go into uh, my eating out expenses, so on and so forth. So you can start to, combine all of these various different tools. So you have pots in there. You can think of how you, what you're learning about your spending from the categories and make decisions to inform how you structure your pots. And everything sort of starts to come together and work quite nicely as an ecosystem of your financial life. And this is P2P, peer-to-peer, um, -peer, like I mentioned earlier. You can very easily make a payment. You can also make a request. Uh, like I said, all you need is for that person to be in Monzo. And we have a, a reference field that actually you can type in an infinitely long reference message. So FPS, which is a short, an acronym for faster payment systems, which is what most banks use, you have a limit as to how much you can put in that reference. Uh, but with Monzo, whenever you're paying someone, you can type in a message as long as you want. And I'll go into that a bit later. But when we think about building a bank that works for everyone. We can have defaults that mean that we are protecting people from things that we know, generally speaking, we have research that shows might not be very good for them financially. So by default, uh, when you use Monzo, you have the uh, gambling transactions blocked. And if you want to unblock that, then there's an element of speaking to customer support. Uh, and what we've seen from this is that adding that human friction increases the likelihood of someone not making that transaction and not uh, starting that habit of, of gambling. Um, and we, we know that this is proven to be really helpful for a lot of customers who wanted to get out of debt, uh, who had not, not so great habits with gambling. But equally, we want to make sure that people have that freedom should they want to uh, gamble in a healthy way. Our research is also showing that people generally want support with reaching their goals. 98% of Monzo customers have financial goals of some kind they're working towards. And what I mean when I say financial goals, I don't mean you know, save 100,000 pounds. A financial goal is a life goal. People want to get married. People want to buy a house. These are the kinds of goals that people are working towards. And often, uh, depending on the level of financial literacy that uh, exists within your household, so if we go back to, let's say, my household as an example, my mom didn't have very high financial literacy. So everything I learn, I'll learn from her. And all the habits I pick up, I pick up from her. So you then end up potentially in a vicious cycle where the generations after generations, people don't have the tools and they're going to have to go out and fend for themselves and figure out the hard way. But we want to build a product whereby the knowledge is built into the product. So the moment you start using it, we can help you course correct where appropriate and help you reach those goals. We're also finding that a lot of people run out of money before payday. I remember speaking to a customer in a study and the customer said, I feel like a payday millionaire and an end of month pauper. I think that's a feeling a lot of us can relate to. The moment that money hits our account, we feel like we can do anything. And, the, and that money might be even be limitless. Um, and we know that people struggle with that pacing. So that graph that you saw earlier, for example, that's one step for us to start to play back what that pacing looks like for people. And you see later on that the idea of visibility being able to see 
where you are today really plays an important role in helping you have a better understanding of where you might want to go and how you might want to get there. So we know from our research as well that people want better visibility. So let's say you have a credit card or you have some kind of spending card where you get like 1% cash back or 5% cash back and you end up using that. But then another deal gets sort of uh, added from another credit card or another uh, spending card and you go to them, et cetera. We know that people have multiple accounts that they're using to maximize their ability to make the most of their money. So they want to have a view of the whole of their financial lives and how it's affecting uh, their, their spending generally. So if you use Monzo and you have Monzo Plus or Premium, you can connect any account through the open banking network and have a view of everything that you're spending on that card in the same way you would if that transaction happened directly on Monzo. What a lot of these things means, not having these things, can mean that people struggle to pay down their debts, which links back to that visual cycle that I mentioned. People don't necessarily understand how can I even build my credit score? Um, I've, I've done some of the things that sh are shown in these credit score apps, but it doesn't seem to be make, making much of a difference. I, and I personally know how this feels. Uh, I've kind of had a decent credit score, uh, better and I think pretty good these days. But I registered to vote. I uh, so, you know, signed up, got a credit card, was spending regularly, paying back in time, et cetera. But it still wasn't bud uh, budging, and I, I couldn't understand a lot of these things. So, what we want to do is to connect that bridge between what we, what we know you are doing and your habits day to day and how it might be in the long run influencing your credit. And generally speaking, people want better ways to grow their savings and maximize what they get out of their money. So I've speak to quite a few customers that say, I've, I don't know how to budget. It's, it's not something I've ever done. And anything I've tried, it's really hard to stick to. So this links back to the overall picture of uh, an idea of wealth and building wealth. So being able to spend less than you're earning, being able to put money away, being able to grow that money and invest at the right level of risk, whereby based on how much time you have on Earth, uh, investment literally is directly correlated with your, your lifetime and how much time there is for that compound interest, which um, I believe it was Einstein that called one of, uh, one of the, uh, the world's wonders. Um, and compound interest, for anyone that doesn't know, is effectively if you put your money away and you invest in, say, a mutual fund, uh, each year the, the amount of interest that you will earn, the amount of money that you will earn from that investment will add to the total amount that, that you have invested, which will then give a greater return. And if you keep adding more and more money, the amount that you get increases, in theory, exponentially. Not always, of course. But let's zoom out a little bit. And let's look at how we're looking in the nation. We know that a third of Brits have less than 600 pound in savings. So that's one third of a country of 60 million people. So if you'd ask these people for um, taking care of an unexpected bill or to think about how they may cover a, a relative's medical expenses that came out of nowhere um, or, you know, anything else that involves responding to unexpected life events, they wouldn't be able to. That's one third of our entire country. And we know that one in 10, that's 9%, don't have any savings at all. If you think about what that says about where people are and how much people need money to work for them and how much people need for financial institutions to meet them where they are, it kind of really paints a picture of how much work there is to do. This is an interesting study from uh, Free Trade. There are far more slides than this, but I've only included this one for reference. In their study, they found out that 88% of the respondents in their study in the UK didn't feel confident in their financial lives. And these people can be in various different financial situations, but the key word here is confident um, in their own financial literacy. And you can also see some hints of the patriarchy there with 85% of men and 91% of women not feeling confident with their finances. So it gives you an idea of generally how people are feeling, particularly as we head into these various different macroeconomic climates uh, with the cost of living crisis, et cetera, what's on people's minds. And this study was carried out before the cost of living crisis uh, started kicking in full force. And I want to talk a little bit about 
what it means when you're designing experiences with the best intentions. I spoke earlier about if you have someone on your contacts and if you're both banking on Monzo, why should you have to put in an account number or sort code? So we build a super easy experience. Um, the P2P payments that I mentioned earlier, P2P. Uh, and if you remember, you can have an infinitely long message in that field. What we found was when, so where you see that spike, that was when uh, WhatsApp, Facebook, and Instagram went down. So people were using Monzo to send one penny transactions to each other with messages. <laughs> now, you can think of that quite facetiously, right? Maybe they were just joking with each other. But it's still interesting. It's an interesting mental model that once you see that a variety of social platforms are down, your instinct is, let me go to Monzo to send my friend a one penny transaction or a payment request. Now, we're going to do some payment request trivia uh, relating to Monzo payments. There are no prizes, just juicy knowledge. All right. So the question is, how many characters do you think in the room the longest payment description on a payment request has? And here are the options. 300,000, 55,000, or 17,000, sorry. Um, hands up for option one. Okay. Hands up for option two. Most of the room. Hands up for option three. Okay. Um, the correct answer is 301,000. And uh, let me tell you a little bit more about that. So at 300,000, someone sent a Monzo payment request with nonsensical words. Basically, if you open up your keyboard and you just type random things and you copy that and you paste that and you copy that again, you paste it, paste it, paste it, paste it. 300,000 characters on a payment request. At 55,000 words is the entire script for the B movie that someone included in the payment request. And at 17,000 words is the entire script for Shrek. People are having a good time with these payment requests. But they also, we know that, like I mentioned earlier, that uh, FPS, uh, faster payment systems, have a limit as to how, how many characters you can actually have on that request. And what's interesting about this is, if you're building a bank for everyone, you're also building a bank for the people that you don't think about, um, especially if they're using your product. These are some of the most common words that people use in payment requests. Things like food, Uber, shop, you can kind of understand these. They're fairly, fairly straightforward. But if you look at the fifth option, enemies. So that was related to, at the point where we ran this analysis, that was related to a Netflix series called The Tinder Swindler. So people had been sending requests and payments to each other, specifically, um, on the subject of uh, the series and they were kind of joking about as well. So this is where it gets not fun and not hilarious. We've seen from our data that some people use Monzo payments and requests to send abusive messages to each other. So let's say, like we mentioned earlier, it's funny when people use uh, one penny transactions to send each other messages because Facebook, et cetera, are down. But if you think about all the world of possibilities and what, what can happen, it means that just like a tool can be used and people can thrive in it, it can also be abused. So we found that um, we did analysis and we found a range of abusive messages, um, ranging to sort of various extremes. And it's not a slew of uh, abusive content. It's not, I wouldn't say the numbers are in the, in the millions, for example. We have millions of customers. Um, but they're large enough, uh, probably, I don't know, in the hundreds, they're large enough for us to do something about it. And even if it was just one, we should do something about it because it means that it's affecting someone else's experience at the other end. And some general data. So the crime survey for England and Wales showed that an estimated 2.3 million adults from 16 to 74 experienced domestic abuse in the last year. And you can see again, signs of the patriarchy there, disproportionate numbers of women versus men. So statistically, if you think about the people using your product, some of these people um, that are experiencing these things 
might be within your product. So how might we protect our community from abuse is one of the questions uh, that we, we asked ourselves. And this is a project that, that I'm working on. Uh, one of the ways that we're thinking about mitigating the likelihood that someone can use Monzo to send abusive content to another user is by enabling a self-serving block. So today, people can already do this, but they would have to contact customer support, they would have to explain their situation, and then the block would be enacted. But what we want to do is we want to remove that friction. Uh, if someone feels they need to protect themselves for whatever reason, we want to give them the power to do that. Now, there are some complexities in our ability to to build something like this. For example, uh, we can't necessarily, at least easily, block uh, any kind of payment. So if you use Monzo, you can still send payments to and, and from other banks uh, using account numbers and sort codes. So when you block someone on Monzo, you're not really blocking that entire person. You're blocking their ability to send you P2P payments, um, and you're, you're, you're blocking their ability to send you P2P requests. We know that goes some distance because where we're seeing the bulk of the abuse is in these uh, payment references that have an infinite number of uh, characters that you can input. So an important question that I ask myself as, in, as a designer when we're thinking about designing for tomorrow and the future, I think it's really important that we always think about what are the experiences that we're enabling inadvertently that might be causing harm to people. Um, I think these days we like to uh, talk about Facebook and how the culture of uh, moving fast and breaking things did break some things, um, and some things that we do not want broken. But actually, we're all creators in the field, and we're all putting out experiences that are influencing people's lives in some ways. So you can build an amazing product that helps people have a better view of their finances, but you might be also enabling things that you don't want to. So think about the ways, as a creator, in which you might, might be doing that, whether you're a designer or not. I want to talk a bit more about some of the other ways in which we're thinking about how you can make the, finance, the financial world work for, for anyone. We ran a study with YouGov where we looked at how uh, people with ADHD experience their financial lives. And we uncovered that basically living with ADHD has a huge impact on how people um, experience money. And for anyone who doesn't know, ADHD uh, is attention, Deficit hyperactivity disorder. And it basically means that people are restless, they can have impulses, uh, and as the name implies, uh, sometimes their attention can, can shift to various things. I, I don't know if anyone in the room here has ADHD, um, but perhaps folks not, may not all be familiar with that. And the numbers are actually quite, quite high, I think. An estimated 1.8 million uh, UK adults uh, are diagnosed with ADHD. And if you think about the nature of any sort of uh, cognitive uh, uh, spectrum, there are still people out there that may not be diagnosed. Uh, so the numbers could actually be much higher than this. And people experiencing uh, financial difficulties as a result of being on the, uh, on the spectrum in some way may be even higher. If you have ADHD, you're four times more likely to impulse spend. Now, um, if, you, if you know for sure you're in a room and you don't have ADHD, and you can think of the times in which you might find yourself in post spending, and maybe how hard you, you might have had to work to stop doing that, imagine four times the challenge of having to work through that. These are the kinds of things that we think about when we're thinking about experiences for everyone. If you have ADHD, you're three times more likely to miss a bill payment. So these challenges mean that ultimately it amplifies into all of the various parts of your financial life. If you have a debt, you, you're going to take longer to pay it back. If you're trying to work towards a goal, you're going to take longer to work towards that goal. So you can, you can build an experience that has all of these various tools, but you also have to think about some of the nuances that might be needed to be, uh, to be baked in so your experience is functional and, and performant for everyone. So having ADHD also means that the experience, how you feel when you use these products is also nuanced and different. At Monzo, we, we do think greatly about how we create delightful experiences. And I think of delight as when you use a product, it feels like your humanness is seen. You feel accepted. You feel heard and you feel 
empowered. I think that's what delight means to me. So if you think about how delightful an experience might be for someone uh, who experiences ADHD, you can imagine it's significantly uh, uh, compromised even while using Monzo. So we ran this study and we actually saw that our product, and this, was, this wasn't deliberate, we didn't deliberately design our product this way, but our product really helped people with ADHD. So things like instant notifications, the moment you spend, you can see it. Uh, things like the ability to understand when you might not have enough money to cover a bill. Uh, things like being able to put money away into a pot, hide that pot, not see it. And if you, have, if you wanna unhide it, you have to speak to customer support. These are not tools that we thought, you know what, let's design a product for people with ADHD. We wanted to design products that work and give people options. And somehow, uh, we ended up designing something that works quite well for people with ADHD. That's not to say we're done, um, but here's, here's some of the insights that we're seeing um, of how our product influences people managing money with ADHD. I won't read them all. I'm sure you can read it. I want to talk a bit more about the, the notion of a vulnerable customer as well. So you have people who are on a spectrum of some kind, who have certain traits and qualities that cannot change. And you have people who are in situations. They found themselves at, at points in their lives where they might be vulnerable. And to give you the definition, uh, a vulnerable customer is someone who, due to their personal circumstances, is especially susceptible to harm particularly when a firm is not acting with appropriate levels of care. That's how the Financial Conduct Authority defines uh, vulnerability in, in when you think about money. And it's really important that we think about these people because their starting point, if you think about you know, equity, diversity, and inclusion, et cetera, their starting point is already further back than the average person. And the FCA run a survey with 250,000 people and they found that 53% of adults within that survey were displaying a character of vulnerability in some way. Now imagine 250,000 adults, over half, showing signs of financial vulnerability. How the FCA wants organizations like Monzo and other uh, financial institutions to think about how they deal with vulnerable customers is to understand their needs, to upskill and building the, the capabilities within an organization to address those needs, to take practical actions, and ideally these should be things that you can measure, to learn from it, and go back again. Um, it almost looks a little bit like a double diamond. <laughs> uh, so I'm not sure if that counts in the bingo. <laughs> um, some of the things that we're doing to make sure that we're thinking about these things, we have uh, very comprehensive guides to make sure that anyone, and I mean anyone, that wants to speak to a vulnerable customer they can just access these guides in Notion with um, clear support on who they need to speak to if, let's say, you're speaking to a vulnerable customer and uh, you, you come across some information that actually you may need to share with the vulnerable customer's team because these are our customers. If they need extra help, we should be able to know what to do. Um, how to speak with people who may have various different situations that might limit their ability to, you know, let's say, even if these days, as uh, we're starting to restart uh, soon anyway, interviews in real life, um, how you can think of making an inclusive environment for running research that these people can actually come in and uh, uh, speak to you and feel like they've been thought, thought about, considered, understood. I wanted to share an example of when, um, even if you're aiming towards some of those metrics that um, the, the first speaker shared about, um, when things actually don't work out. And this is, this is actually my work, so um, be kind. Um, when, uh, at the moment, we have a referral program at Monzo. And in the summer, if you, if you invited two friends, you'd get a neon card, a really nice, shiny card. Um, but we've, we, we've had a give five pound, get five pound program active since uh, January this year. And if you invite your friend uh, to Monzo and they tap through the link, they enter their details, it means that they're now in the process of claiming a referral. So we'll know that that's, that's happening. Um, now, not everyone that claims a referral is gonna end up being a Monzo customer, even if they want to. We'll have, they'll have to go through 
uh, checks a sign up, they'll have to go through the identity verification. So it does mean that it's okay for us to lose some people in the funnel because we don't want to enable crime on our platform. But when they do make it through and uh, they become Onzo customers and they add money to their account, um, we know that uh, soon they're gonna receive their referral bonus of five pound. So what we did was, um, this example on the left, this, this was before my time, we, we always did that, is the moment you've joined Monzo and you're a new customer, we, we have a placeholder transaction that says, the moment you spend money on your card, you're gonna get this five pound. And as an experiment, we wanted to see how much more likely would uh, someone making a referral be to make the next referral if we did the same on their side. So if we put a placeholder five pound transaction to say, hey, your friend has started signing up to Monzo, they're here, and if they spend on their card, you're gonna get five pounds. And we, we had some feedback, not only from customers, but actually from people in our team as well. Um, and this, this is the one that stood out to me. Uh, it's cruel of Monzo to pretend to have money coming in. Um, and if you think about the current economic climate, uh, it might be. It, it, it might be deceitful to actually have a transaction that may never materialize if someone else doesn't do something. And if we go back about the start of this, uh, of this talk around setting goals for yourself to depend on the actions of other people, this is the primary example uh, of that. So we changed our minds. Um, we realized it felt gray. And it was an experiment um, that was intended for us to learn. And we learned that even if it does result in more people sending a referral, it, it doesn't make us feel good. Um, our guts tell us it's not the right thing. So we didn't do it. We didn't ship. I think when we're designing the future, when we're designing for everyone, we should be okay with changing our minds. We're not imperfect creatures, so why should we expect to get every decision perfectly? It's okay in your career, uh, in your practice, to make mistakes. What's crucial is how you respond to those mistakes. So on the thread of how do you design a product for everyone, I've spoken about a bank. But some of the things that we've seen today um, involve giving access. Who can access your product today? Who have you made the deliberate choice to say, these are the people that absolutely have to find their way through the door? And what are you doing to make sure that happens in the work that you do? When they're through the door, how are you making sure that they feel included? How are you making sure that they feel considered? How are you keeping them there? And what structures do you have in place in your team to make sure that's happening? When you're listening, how well are you listening? Are you listening because you have an agenda? Because you're trying to make those numbers go up and to the right? Or are you really giving space, keeping quiet, and trying to understand what that window into someone's life is telling you about that human being? One of Monzo's values is default to transparency. And this value is an interesting one because sometimes it can actually mean that lots of information that might be uncomfortable for senior leadership to share in public is just shared in public. And there's a lot of trust. There have been probably like two leaks or something, at least in my time there. But for the most part, we all understand that this information is, is trusted. And we're being trusted with this information. And thus, we shouldn't cause any harm with it. So it means that everyone feels comfortable doing the same. Uh, when we make mistakes, uh, for the most part, at least the people I work with, we all put our hand up and say, no, I don't think this one was right. Um, I think we should reflect on this one and adjust. So when mistakes happen in your organization uh, or in, the, in your places of work, how are you responding to it? Who finds out about it? Do you keep it to yourself? Do you discuss as a team? And I mean really discuss. I don't mean some of the more, uh, uh, let's say, politically correct things that you might say are retro. I mean the actual mistakes, the things that potentially might make you seem like a not so great designer. And lastly, it's also about being accountable. Um, when you do make those mistakes, own it. Understand that it, it was made by you. And often, you, you made that mistake with the information you had at the time, but now you have new information. So you can make better decisions. So remain accountable, don't change your mind. And by that, I mean, don't hide it from people. Thank you.